Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate our listeners on matters related to finance, legal, insurance, accounting, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you will find our content useful as well as entertaining. The Expert Network Team consists of Carl Frank of AI Financial, Mike Miller of Miller and Associates CPAs, Jeff Cromendike of Security First Insurance Agency, and I'm Nathan Merrill. I'm an attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill. Together, our independent team combines our expertise to provide you insights and solutions, some straightforward, some profound, for real-life opportunities we see on a daily basis. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the Expert Network Team members in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. We encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our team members. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Now on to today's podcast. Hello, listeners. Welcome to your expert team podcast. Uh, we have a full house here today. This is Jeff Cromendike uh, coming to you from Security First Insurance Agency. We have Nathan Merrill with Goodspeed in Merrill. Hi there. Hello, Nate. Good to have you. And Carl Frank with AI Financial. Carl, thanks for hosting us today. It's You're great very to welcome. see you. And um, yeah, out from um, you know the middle of who knows where. Mike's been traveling. We've uh, not seen him uh, much, but we are so glad you're here, Mike. With um, um, having you uh, here to to talk a little bit more about what uh, strong balance sheet looks, uh, what what it should look like. But um, uh, Mike, uh, welcome. We're just glad you're here and um, and take us away a little bit. Tell us what you're going to talk about. Aloha and buenos dias. Yes. I was say, <laughs> you're sporting a nice tan there. Is that what you brought back from Hawaii? That's what I brought back. <laughs> Um, yeah, so to kick it off, I was I, it, during this this COVID pandemic. I was during tax season. I walked out of my office to go get some lunch, <clears throat> and one of the business owners across the hall happened to be walking out, and he's a dentist. <clears throat> and he said, I, I was talking to him. And I said, "So, hey, how you doing with this?" Because the dentist's office were closed. He was in just doing some cleanup in his office, uh, and he said, "No, I, I did okay. You know, we're fine." And I said, "Well, did you get a PPP loan?" And he goes. No, I didn't need one. My balance sheet's pretty strong. We, we're, we're okay. And I was like, oh, really? I said, what does that mean? What, what, what does a strong balance sheet mean? He goes, well, I just had a whole bunch of cash set aside. I set, a lot, I set aside a bunch of cash because I knew a rainy day would be happening sometime. And I didn't want to have to lay off people. And I said, great. So it's an convers- awfully responsible thing to do. Yes. Um, he had actually, <laughs> I think he said he had like eight months reserves in cash wow. set aside, just, just in case, uh, which is the smart thing to do, to your point. Uh, but not everybody does that. So we went on to have a conversation about there's more to a strong balance sheet than that because cash can't control the balance sheet. So I gave him the analysis, and, and, and I do this a lot with my clients, is when you look at your personal finances, right, <clears throat> if you look at your balances on the personal finance, how, how does money come in? Well, money comes in wages, right, or you've got self-employment income or something. Then you have bills that you have to pay, right? You have your mortgage, you have utilities, you have a car payment, insurance, clothing, meals out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you come up with a number. And at the end of the month or end of the pay period, whatever you measure it on, you either have more money or not less money, right? You have a positive or a negative number when that's said and done. If it's a positive number, great, you've got extra cash. What are you going to do with it? If you don't have enough money, where's it going to come from? You got to take it out of savings. You got to get a loan. You got to use credit cards, right? Somehow, if you, somehow you have to fund that shortage, or maybe take it out of retirement funds. <clears throat> so then, then you start looking at the balance sheet and going, well, where am I going to take it from? Now you're looking at it on the balance sheet. Balance sheet's basically assets, liabilities, and equity, right? Assets minus liabilities equals equity. So you look at that from a net worth perspective, and you say, I've got cash in the bank. I've got some some stocks and investments. Uh, I've got a home that's worth so much. I've got maybe a car that's worth so much. <clears throat> Those are your total assets. And then you look at the liability side and you go, I've got a mortgage, I've got uh, credit card payments, I may have a line of credit on the house, um, may have a, a loan on the car, and then assets minus those liabilities is you have a positive or a negative net worth. Mm-hmm. If your assets exceed your liabilities, you've got a positive net worth. If they don't, you have a negative net worth. What position do you want to be in? 
Well, every month, every year. Is that a you, trick question? You no, know, it should be a very easy question. <laughs> okay. But I don't think everyone looks at this when they talk about you know personal finances and budgeting. Sure. People don't really think about this. What I find in my line of work is businesses don't think about it either. <clears throat> so when I was talking to this guy about this, I used that example. He goes, wow, that's really a good example. Can we talk some more about that balance sheet? <clears throat> and I was a little sympathetic. I didn't charge him for any of this because they're not open and they were closed. But I said, sure. I said, from a strong balance sheet perspective, I kind of made notes of, of what we talked about when we did it. And I said, well, there's, there's really four elements to a strong balance sheet. There's intelligent working capital. There's income generating assets. There's a positive cash flow. And there's a balanced capital structure. <clears throat> and you want to have income generating assets. So if you look at intelligent working capital, there's a ratio on the balance sheet that is basically your current assets divided by your current li liabilities. What does that mean? That basically means what's your ability to meet your current obligations. Right? Do you have enough cash flow to meet your current expenses? Right? That's what that ratio means. Usually you want that ratio to be a 1.2 to 2.0 range. It's a strong ratio. Right, so just stopping, stopping in there. So what are we talking about in terms of the assets we're measuring against current liabilities? Current assets. So your current assets are your income generating assets. So that'd be like AR and... Right. What do, what do, I have, what do you have in AR? Okay. Right. What what cash do you have in the bank? Is okay. this cash always coming in, or are you always depleting cash? Got it. Right. So you look at your current assets. Could be inventory if you're a manufacturer or a buyer and reseller of goods. Right. How much cash do you have tied up in inventory? What's your turns on your inventory? So you're looking at your current asset balance and saying all those items added up in total, divided by your total current debt. What's due in the next 12 months? Do you have enough cash flow coming off of that? Are your assets generating enough income to cover that? Why are they called intelligent assets, if I might ask? It's intelligent working capital. Oh, okay. Not assets, but Sorry. working capital. Because that's your working capital. Your current assets generate income. I just never heard that phrase before. That's no. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's what current assets are. Got working it. Working capital. <clears throat> so you don't want to tie up too much in, in one asset, right? You don't want to have all your money in cash. You don't want to have it all in stocks. You certainly don't want to have it all tied up in inventory if you're not turning inventory quickly. And you want to be looking at your accounts receivable and collecting those as quick as possible and not having to push those out 30, 60, 90 days, right? That kind of gives you a strong current asset base, right? <clears throat> if you have too much cash on hand and you're not using it right, you're missing opportunities either to invest the money or pay off debt. So you constantly want to be evaluating your current assets. It's a balancing act. <clears throat> so when you look at income generating assets, you're looking at what are performing and non-performing assets. Um, and so, so you want to get rid of the non-performing. In my line of work, what are my assets? What's well, my people? So I generate a lot of cash, right? Because we're service-based. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when I look at clients who aren't paying, we're going to address that. They're non-performing assets. My clients are my non-performing assets. So we're always looking at cash flow from an accounts receivable perspective, <clears throat> right? If, I, if you have assets in the financial world, right, if they're non-performing, what do you do? You gotta fire them. Okay, you get rid of them, right? Same thing when you have inventory. If you have inventories that are slow laggards and they're not selling, get rid of them. Replace them with something that's gonna sell and turn quicker. You wanna improve that cash flow, increase that current asset position. <clears throat> uh, positive cash flow, I mean, that's, that's the key indicator for a strong balance sheet because cash is king. But, but you just gotta watch it. You don't wanna you know, have too much cash and, and, and not be utilizing it properly. Um, in order to have a good, strong, cash flow you need to manage it which is you know you don't you want to forecast it you want to you want to plan for it you want to have it projected out so you know how much is coming in and when it's coming in um, business is doing well when it regularly regularly maintains a, a minimum cash reserve which is what this dentist had, had done i think he had a little too much in cash eight months i think would have been a little excessive um, and then pan, then the pandemic hit and i was just like we wouldn't have known what was reasonable and what wasn't based on the situation Fortunately, they were only closed for, what, two, two months, two and a half months? Mm -hmm. But he didn't have to lay anybody off. He was able to pay everybody. He didn't need to get a PPP loan. You know, he was, he was, he was doing good. <clears throat> so if I can stop you there for just a little discussion on that. In a non-pandemic environment, how would one normally come up with what their best reserves might be? If you were looking at from a balance sheet perspective, or maybe you'll get to this, but what kind of rule of thumb or... Your financial advisors usually say six months of expenses, right? So that's you, really, you usually want that reserve set aside for the rainy day. Depends on your business, and maybe it's three months because of right. what your structure is. Could be nine months or 12 months. Well, similar to you, you know, we're a service business. If we're not using people, we're not going to keep them 
around necessarily just to sit and twiddle their thumbs. So unlike inventory, if we end up in a significant downturn, we can cut our expenses dramatically. So we wouldn't necessarily need to maintain six months operating expenses unless we wanted to keep a stale workforce through that extended period of time, right? Right. Yeah, and, and, and coming up here is short So it's like is, fixed versus variable type stuff. Yes. You, you take into account. Somewhat, yes. Okay. It, it's, it's expense management, but we'll get to that. Okay. <clears throat> so the next item for a strong balance sheet is really your balance, a balanced capital structure, right? Are you are you debt or equity funded, right? Debt is good. You know, when the, when the, when the business is doing good and the interest rates are low, you can write off some interest. You can use the debt to create current assets that generate income by buying assets or whatever needs to be done um, if you're highly and then you're you're kind of a highly leveraged company and it's and it's good when times are good it's not good when times are bad um, when you're heavily heavily equity financed um, that can be good or bad as well depending on your situation what, what kind of business you're running right because your investors are going to want some sort of return on investment on their investment right <clears throat> so in in the 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 debt equity rule, rule like the current asset ratio you have a debt to equity ratio right so debt to, debt to equity ratio you never want that debt to equity ratio to be more than two so you kind of watch that when you look at your balance sheet so when i run when i run my balance sheet and my financials i have these key performance indicators one's the current ratio one's the debt to equity ratio and i want to monitor those and by doing that i'm managing the strength of my balance sheet it's one of the key key indicators i use um, Income generating assets, to your point, they're either people or they're they're fixed assets. I mean, if you're if you're a manufacturing business, mm-hmm. you're key producing assets. Not only could be your people, but it's the equipment that produce what you're selling, right? Because because if those go down, you don't have any inventory. You're you're kind of screwed. Right. And in today's environment, we're really working off a just in time type thing. So you're producing and pushing it out the door. It's not like you're trying to store a whole bunch of stuff on the side to sell. You're hopefully got pre-orders you're manufacturing and set, setting, you know, getting them out, keep that cash flow strong. If you're manufacturing product and setting aside, hoping you sell it, there's probably a significant problem in your financial statements. So <clears throat> absent of proper balance sheet management, you can go from a strong balance sheet to a fragile balance sheet pretty quick, right? If your debt's higher than your, than your assets, you're in that negative quote unquote net worth position or negative equity position, which means your survivability, depending on the economy, is weak. Might not make it. That's where a lot of businesses close up. Mm-hmm. Close up shop. So, Mike, as we think about a, a strong balance sheet, um, what are what are lending institutions looking at specifically as it relates to, um, you know, a, a balance sheet, uh, income statement, things like that? What are what are they looking for as it relates to the strength behind a? They're looking at those two ratios that I just defined. They look almost exclusively at the current ratio, the current assets divided by current liabilities, and the debt to equity ratio. Okay. Those, if if those are strong, you're probably going to get a loan pretty okay. easily. Yeah. All right. Those are those are two of their key indicators. Yep. That they look at. <clears throat> so if your balance sheet isn't quite so strong, maybe it's starting to cross over into that fragile piece. You may want to identify the causes as we just kind of talked through some of those as to what could be uh, <clears throat> leading to that effect on your balance sheet. You know, obviously take actions to improve the processes and the decision making and then enforce accountability within your company to say, hey, this, this is what we're doing, why we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, to strengthen that balance sheet. And it is, uh, to your point, Nate, if you're people intensive, well, what, what do you have? You have income coming in from people, and you have wages, and you have expenses. What can you manage and control those expenses? Right. And, but, you know, just to give you an example of one of the things, one of the issues we were facing, and I've seen this with other professional services organizations, even large ones, is they, they feel, start to feel the pinch on production. And so they start to cut their workforce as their primary cost. But in the process, they actually cut their ability to make additional revenue. So it's like a vicious downward cycle at, or can be at some level. So one of the things we, like in the pandemic, one of the efforts or initiatives we really looked towards was keeping the team intact so that we maintained our productive capacity. And then we just focused on filling up everybody's plate. So because if we cut back our productive ability, our fixed costs still stayed the same. Exactly. And so in order to keep our ratios, 
you know, we looked at first maintaining, and then about July, we actually looked at starting to expand operations. Um, but what if you can't expand operations? What if you can't fill everyone's plate? Those tough decisions have to be made to sure. say, in order to strengthen my balance sheet, I got I to gotta cut some costs. Right. And unfortunately, that means you got to downsize, you get rid of some people, and maybe get rid of some of those costs that are fixed that you don't need and you can get out but of. But the knee jerk of what we avoided doing was without knowing, because you know nobody knew how this was going to impact the economy. We deferred immediate action, which is what was happening, You know, which is why PP was originally passed was to keep workforce intact, basically. I mean, you could you could argue that that was the fundamental goal of government was to prevent all the layoffs from occurring, to keep workforces intact. And so we, we uh, I think all of us, really ponied up at the opportunity to do that. And then it was just a question of making that workforce productive. Yeah. So what you just told me was you had a strong balance sheet. You were able to weather that storm right by not laying people off and you have to do that because you have but some of that is choice i guess that's the point i'm making is you can put yourself in a tight spot by making a bad choice to weaken your balance sheet out of fear that you have a weak balance sheet. i mean it's like that's why i say it's kind of a vicious cycle is if i start trimming workforce then i completely cut back my ability to produce income which makes my balance sheet less viable and strong so people have to resist that urge i think to to recoil uh, in they have to understand their they have to understand their financial statements, yeah. right? Because if they're weak, if they're fragile, and they come into that situation that you just described, you can't just keep people on the payroll. Sure, sure. You don't have any cash unless the government the, gives you money. Unless your government gives you a PPP, <laughs> right? But let's let's say in the absence sure. of the government funding your operations, if you can't get access to you know short term lending or equity infusion, you're you're cutting costs somewhere. You have Absolutely. To. Right. So when I was in, in corporate America, we had, we had two things. One, it was uh, you go through the headcount reduction, right? If business goes down, you lose a key client. I mean, your biggest expense is, is labor most of the time. Um, and then we went into what we call scorched earth policy. So nobody could spend a dollar without the CFO or the CEO approving it. And literally, it was like, I need to buy some pens. They got to approve it. And I, I literally worked for U.S. West at, at, when we had this going on, and we literally took an inventory of everyone's desk of what office supplies we had and put them in one room and said, if you need anything, this is where it is. We can't buy anything. That's pretty intense. Yeah. You but know, that's, that's, that's harsh yeah, that's, expense controls. Right, right. Very that, harsh. That's getting up there. Mike, what would you say for, let's say that dentist didn't have a strong balance sheet today. I mean, he came out of this and, and we'll just make up a, a situation because there may be some companies out there who are in that position. And they look back at last year, and, and maybe because he had to shut down his business for so long, he needs to, uh, he could qualify for PPP round two, like Nate and I were talking about a, you know, on a previous podcast uh, about, the, about the legislation that came out at the end of 2020. Well, you can go back and get PPP round two if you have a quarter of revenue that went lower than what it was the year prior to that. So if he qualified for that, would you recommend that he goes out and gets more PPP loan? I mean, why not? If here's my two cents on that, if his business is strong now, I would say no. Why do I say that? <clears throat> yes, he qualifies, right? Because the, the the two main criteria one are you're in business as of February fifteenth, twenty twenty. The next one is you had a you had a decrease in revenue of twenty five percent in twenty twenty compared to the prior quarter in twenty nineteen. Well, and I'll add the sleeper in there, which is you need it like you, you that's what i'm okay. getting at okay. when, when you attest on the form because i've seen it for some of my clients i think it's you go through the questions and you're you're initialing these things and one of them says you need this money because of it's a necessity question right. you need this money to stay alive which tells me there's a going concern question that right there the attorneys i've talked to that deal with the sba they're going these 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 loans are going to be audited way more heavily than the first ones because they weren't as defined. That clause means you needed the money to keep your doors open. So you basically almost have to have an insolvent balance sheet or you you need to be approaching that or headed that direction. You have to be able to prove that you needed that money. And how do you prove that? Forecasting what your revenues appear to be over the next year. So in in that case, if the dentist came to me and said that, I would say, what does your cash flow look like? What does your business look like? Oh, I'm back to normal. You don't need it. It's a different situation, it's a different, isn't it? Yeah, it's a whole yeah this situation. gets back to the Good fine advice. tuning we talked about. You right. know, as we looked at how they've learned from the PPP past experience, one, yeah. or just the, the 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 element of time has given them the ability to be a little bit more surgical in right. how they. Right. 
Now, if you're a restaurant business, it seems like you could oh, make a strong yeah. case. Yeah, yeah. That, oh, that's pretty much a no-brainer. Yeah, and they're 100 percent deductible this year. So yes, <laughs> go eat, eat out eat with your, your friends. Go, go spend money. <laughs> Just make sure there's business purpose. <laughs> yes, we can do that. Absolutely. Mike, so, any parting thoughts? Uh, just, you know, when you're dealing with a strong balance sheet, just keep a, a forward focus, right? What's happening in the future? What could impact your business? What are your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, as you like to preach, Jeff? Oh, yeah. SWOT analysis, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's good. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Okay. Appreciate it. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. Aloha and buenos dias. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the information we shared. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with someone else and join us next time. If you want to meet with a member of the team, please contact us at, at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's info at expertnetworkteam.com. If you have special topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to us and let us know at the same email address. Again, that's info at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the firms represented, nor does it constitute legal investment or accounting advice. And the views are those of the professionals only. Investment advisory services may be provided through ANI Financial Services and securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.